Do you know anybody whose life has taken a bad turn? You know, it is almost impossible to imagine that any of us is not familiar with someone who's hurting, a person whose life has suddenly skidded off the runway of progress, somebody who's sick, somebody who's financially set back, somebody whose marriage has gone in a direction that neither of the couple ever predicted in the beginning. Every one of us knows somebody who's hurting today. In fact, we're surrounded with hurting people. Life is full of trouble. Well, uh, sometimes we can be our own worst enemy. How many of you could say, man, when I think back on some of the things I've done, it's a wonder I've been blessed at all. But we can sometimes hurt ourselves more than anyone around us. In fact, there's a website called 24-7 Wall Street. It has nothing to do with Wall Street Journal. 24-7 Wall Street is a business and a economics website that has become very well known for its lists. They have things like the 10 best cities to live, the 12 best stocks to watch for, and the 100 most powerful leaders in the world. Well, last year, or earlier this year, they came out with a list that was unlike any I'd ever seen. It was called the 50 least powerful people in the world. <laughs> and of course, I had to check to make sure I wasn't on it, so I, I thank God I wasn't on it, but I, maybe that means I'm much further down than the 50. But most of the people on the list are people you've heard of, and especially if you might be in one of those industries. But number two on the list, for instance, of the least powerful people, and this is a list of people who had, for whatever reason, had lost significant amount of money or influence within the last 12 or 15 months. The number two person on the list was Roger Ailes, the former head of Fox News. He had started with Fox News in the very beginning, but here within the last few months, he lost his position due to the allegations of unwanted uh, harassment of female employees. Number nine on the list was John Boehner, the former uh, Ohio congressman who had become Speaker of the House only to be embroiled in controversies uh, of criticism from both sides of the aisle. He finally got tired of it and uh, just walked away from being Speaker of the House and resigned his position in Congress. Number 10 on the list, Mayor Bill de Blasio from New York City, a rising superstar on the left when he ran for mayor and easily won in a three-way race, but today his star is fading because of uh, corruption uh, uh, allegations. He's currently under five separate investigations for corruption, including one by the FBI. Later on down the list, number 18, Chris Christie. Number 19, Bill Cosby. We all know about all that. Number 22, Jared Fogle. You say, who? He's the subway guy, the guy that ate all the subway and lost all the weight. And well, now he's in federal prison for inappropriate behavior with children. Number 29 on the list, Johnny Manziel. I'll just stop right there. <laughs> I didn't write the list. I'm just reporting it. Now, most of the people on the list of the top 50 least powerful people in the world are people who lost influence or money as a result of their own actions or moral failures. None of us would ever want to be on a list of that kind. But in reality, most suffering in the world today is not brought on by our own failures. You go to the doctor and discover that you're sick. Your marriage ends, even though you wanted it to last a lifetime. Your children get into trouble that they were never raised to be involved in. Your job changes because the industry is changing so quickly, and new management changes everything about what you've been secure with, and you look around and suddenly you realize that your troubles have mounted up around you in ways that you could have never predicted and you cannot be held accountable for, but here you are. Well, imagine for a moment 
If you multiply that level of trouble by every single person around you with the same level of difficulty and trouble, and you begin to realize that this is a world full of trouble, that everywhere you look, there's trouble, and people have problems they never saw coming. They have troubles they can barely deal with, and it's not just one or two. It's congregations and cities and nations of the world filled with troubles. Most of us are surrounded by people close to us who have more pain than power, more suffering than success, more heartache than happiness, and more grief than greatness. Well, my question is a simple one today. As believers today, how can our faith play a role in helping the people around us? Well, that's what I want us to look at today as we look at the subject, our faith and the needs of others. Would you open your Bibles with me, please, again to the fourth chapter of John, John chapter 4, beginning today at verse 46, talking about Jesus. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. We looked at that a couple weeks ago. And at Capernaum, now watch, the two cities have been mentioned here in close proximity. Here's what's going on. Jesus has come to Cana, but there's another man in Capernaum. Now, Cana was in the hill country. We don't know exactly where it was. We just know the vicinity. There's two or three different locations that uh, archaeologists believe may have been Cana. They're all in close proximity, but in in all candor, the sands of history have wiped Cana off the face of the earth. We know approximately where it was. Capernaum, on the other hand, we can go to today. We're absolutely certain. It's on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee, and it is today an impressive national park in the city of, I mean, in the nation of Israel. It was about 20 miles from biblical Cana, wherever Cana was. We may be debating this or that location in a close-knit region. So Jesus comes to Cana, but there's a man in Capernaum who hears that Jesus is in Cana. So I don't know how much time had passed, enough for a few days for somebody to relate the fact that Jesus is in Cana. Cana. It takes a day and a half, two days, to walk the rugged mountain path from Capernaum, which is 730 feet below sea level, way up into Cana, which is a hillside village, a mountain village. So some days have passed since Jesus has arrived. Jesus is extremely well known at this point. It's early in his ministry. He's done a lot of miracles down in Jerusalem, and you know, there was a a play, a Broadway play a few years ago, Jesus Christ Superstar. A lot of people took offense by the title, but Jesus really was a superstar in his day. Everybody knew him. Everybody talked about him. Everybody wanted to be close to him. Well, this man in Capernaum had a real big need. He had a son that was extremely ill. Let's keep reading. At Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. An official. Now, that's the Greek word basilikos. And uh, the Greek word basilia means king. How many have been to Rome? You've seen St. Peter's Basilica. A basilica means a palace. Basilikos means he was a royal official. This was probably not a Jewish person. This was probably a Roman citizen who was working for Herod the king. Her this Herod was the one who had decapitated John the Baptist. He was a weak but cruel king. Weak because he had been manipulated by his wife and, and uh, what people would think about him, and, and yet he was bloodthirsty and was willing, like all the Herods, to do anything to maintain power. So in a weak moment, uh, because his wife had outsmarted him and because everybody was watching, he had John the Baptist killed. This official was an employee, a close associate with that Herod. And you think, well, what in the world would a person like that have to do with Jesus? I can tell you for certain what the issue was. His little boy was dying. And this Bible 
of mine says that this official had a son who was ill. The word son there means little boy, not a baby, not a teenager, grade school, little boy. I don't know if any of you have ever walked through a children's hospital or stood beside the bed of your own child when they're sick or the children of others who are ill. And there's nothing in this world that'll touch the heart of every adult in the world, regardless of your race, your national origin, regardless of the background you come from. There's nothing that touches us like the illness of a child. And this man, even though he worked for a bloodthirsty king with no scruples and no sense of faith, he came to a place where the need of his life was greater than Well, it reached the priority that he said, I've got to go to Jesus. And the Bible says his son was ill. We don't know the illness. The word ill there is the word which means completely without strength. This boy was essentially lifeless. And the Bible says in verse 47, when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee... He went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And so Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Isn't this an astounding and surprising response? I mean, it feels like Jesus is stiff-arming this guy spiritually. This is not the response you would expect from Jesus. Here is a a father whose little boy is dying, and he comes to Jesus with, with urgency and humility and says, please come and heal my little boy. And Jesus said, you know, unless you people see miracles, you're never going to believe. Jesus was resisting. You say, why does God do that? Well, this passage gives us some insight. Verse 49 says, the official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. And the man believed the word. Everybody say, believed the word. Believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. Everybody say, recovering. Say it again. I'm going to preach a sermon on that one of these days. And let me tell you why. Because I want you to notice the tense of this. The Bible does not say the boy recovered. The Bible says he was recovering. You say, what's significant about that? Well, how many of you have prayed and you're getting better, but you're not there yet, but you're recovering? Could I see your hand? I'm recovering. Pastor, I'm getting better. Raise your hand. Then give God praise for what you got. Just because you haven't been all the way healed doesn't mean God's not working. I never noticed that until this week. I'm going to preach on that one of these days. Amen? I'm not all the way healed, but I'm getting better. Amen. That's a lot of us. Verse 52. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, that's one o'clock in the afternoon, the fever left him. So one of the symptoms was a high fever, but that's gone. The little boy woke up, said, I need a drink of water and uh, bring me my basketball. I'm feeling a little better. And the father knew That was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed, say believed, and all his household. This story that we're reading right now is about the importance of believing God so that you can be a minister on behalf of somebody else. This, This man believed and his faith was the vehicle, his faith was the track that his son's healing rolled on. How important is your faith? Child of God, here's where I want us to get to, that my faith is not about just what's good for me. My faith is about, oh man, what God can do in the lives of those around me when I really believe. I love what 
Greg Laurie said not too long ago, and he said, if you have faith in God, if you believe that God can use you, if you are willing to take a step of faith, then God can do incredible things through you. Listen, one of the reasons that God has you in that household where he has you, one of the reasons God has you in that office where he has you, in that school where he has you, in this church where he has you, in this city where he has you, in this time in history when you live is because your faith is going to make a difference in the life of somebody else. God can use people of faith. Now, in John's gospel, there are seven miracles that John calls signs. This is the second, and it is a big one. It is a matter of life and death, a man with a dying son, a man watching his son breathe perhaps his last breath, and he comes to understand that Jesus is a day and a half journey away. Jesus can be reached a day and a half from now. Can you imagine how difficult It must have been for that dad to look at his son struggling for breath, burning up with a fever, no home remedies to help him. The local doctor is at his wit's end. There is uh, no way that this boy is going to do anything but die unless a miracle happens. And this dad's got to look at that little boy and say, Daddy's got to go now. But I'll be back. And as he left that bedside, He wasn't sure he was ever going to see that little boy again, alive. I wonder what he must have been thinking as he took that 20-mile journey and found Jesus and said, please come help my son. And Jesus said, what's wrong with you people? Why, Why do I guys do miracles for you to believe? But the man said, come, come quickly before my son dies. And then the miracle. Jesus said, your son will live. And the boy recovered or got on the path of recovery. Now, what in this story relates to you? How does this story intersect with the lives of the people hurting in your world. How many of you, let me put it this way, are going to sit down at a Thanksgiving table and look across the table at somebody who's going through one of the biggest battles they've ever faced in life, and what role will you play in that? Well, here's the principle I want us to see today. It's a simple principle. Our faith moves us. That is, it, our faith motivates us and mobilizes us. It, our faith moves us to bring the needs of others to the Lord. Our faith moves us to bring the needs of others to the Lord. Reese Howells was a a man of prayer in another generation, early part of the 20th century. And Reese Howells once said this, when the suffering of others becomes so painful to you that you plead for them as if for yourself, that's intercession. I mean, child of God, there comes a day when you realize, hey, no matter how bad I got it, somebody I love's got it worse, and I'm going to forget about me long enough to believe God for a miracle in the life of my child, my wife, my husband, my boss, my employee, my Sunday school friend, my uh, co-worker, that student in that class uh, alongside me. But God, I know I got trouble, but their troubles are, make mine seem forgettable for the moment. So Lord God, please help them. And you say, well, you know, pastor, if only we would have lived back then when we could have seen Jesus of Nazareth in the flesh, that would have been, we'd have been so much more powerful. What are you talking about? Come on, man. Jesus hadn't been to the cross. He hadn't risen from the dead. He hadn't poured out the spirit at Pentecost. They didn't have one page of the New Testament. It was only after the resurrection that Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Listen, when you go to the Lord Jesus, now you're not going to a sandal-wearing peasant from Nazareth. You're going to the one who's seated on a throne, who holds all the authority of heaven and earth, who's at the right hand of God praying for you. You've got more authority in your prayer life than this man ever had. 
Don't tell me you want to see Jesus of Nazareth in the flesh. This man, it took him a day and a half to find Jesus. Your answer is a breath away. The, the answer, the miracle you're looking for is on the tip of your tongue. Say it. Pray it. Let God do it. Your miracle is so close right now, it's only a, a prayer away. This story is obviously about a man's faith, faith on behalf of another. You say, well, what kind of faith is it going to take for me to see those kind of miracles in my family's life? Well, I can share with you some principles. Let's see how it works out. But we've got to have a praying faith. You've got to have a praying faith. You say, what are you talking about? Well, look at verse 47. Verse 46 says that Jesus had come to Cana, and the man was in Capernaum, and his son was ill, so there's the problem. Look at verse 47. When the man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked. Amen. He asked. How many of you know that there's power in asking? Prayer is asking. Charles Spurgeon said, asking is the coin of the realm in the kingdom. You know what that means? That means that just like your Visa card will work at Macy's, prayer works with God. It is the currency of the kingdom. When you ask, you can expect results. Now, 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 lady, if you won't ever ask and you got lack, you may as well get used to being empty if you won't ask. Sir, if you will not, because of pride or doubt, if you're unwilling to bow your knee and ask, then get used to being in the circumstances you're in. But if you, as a child of God, are willing to say, Lord, I'm asking for your help, then, friend, heaven is on the way. Because God has promised to hear and answer us when we, what? Ask. As a matter of fact, this word for ask is not even the word that we might expect here in John's gospel. In the Greek New Testament, there are a couple of different words that John might have chosen. This particular word happens to be the exact same word that is used, are you with me? Every single time in the Bible where the Bible mentions that Jesus requested something of his Father or that Jesus asked something from his heavenly Father, this is the Greek word for ask that is used 100% of the time when the Bible says Jesus asked of the Father. Oh, my goodness. This is a key that will fit the lock. Ask. Ask. There's power, friend, in asking. And when you've got a family member who's suffering, when you've got a, a, a co-worker who's going through the valley of the shadow, friend, your most powerful resource is believing faith that knows how to ask God. And can you imagine, can you just imagine for a minute why we must be a house of prayer because we're a community of prayer warriors and when one of us suffers, it's not just one other that's praying on our behalf, but hundreds can gather together and bombard heaven until God says, I pay attention to that kind of faith. I got hundreds of people praying for one, let me marshal the power of heaven. Glory to God. When that stops being true, I'll stop preaching. This is what it's all about, ladies and gentlemen. You know, Lifeway Christian Resources did a survey in 2014 to, to, to find out what we ask when we pray. 82% of the time we pray for family and friends. That's good. 21% of the people who pray, pray to win the lottery. But only 12% pray for the government. No wonder we're in such a mess. Come on, we need to learn how to pray and ask God. Tim Keller is the uh, well-known pastor of the Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Manhattan. And uh, in his book on prayer, he said that he only discovered prayer in the second half of his life. Now, this is a pastor with 8,000 people every Sunday in multiple locations around the Big Apple. And uh, he had been a seminary professor and a pastor, and 
uh, author, and he said he discovered prayer in the second half of his life. He had been preaching a series on the Psalms when he came to realize that he wasn't scratching the surface in prayer, and then the wheels came off life in 2001. On 9-11, the city was attacked just down the street from one of his main locations. His wife was suffering from Crohn's disease, and he was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, and it all came at once, the perfect storm of difficulty and trouble, the nation, his family, his own health. One day his wife came to him and said, Tim, we have got to start praying for each other together every night. And he said that after all these years of being married and being a pastor and a Christian leader, that was one thing they had never done consistently, pray together every night. And, and he even remarked, every night? <laughs> Just candidly admitted. And she said, Tim, if you were diagnosed with a disease and you had hours to live and the doctor said to you, if you'll take this one pill, you'll live would you forget to take that pill, or would you make sure that no matter what, you took that pill? And she said, I want you to know, Tim, that if we don't start praying together, we're not going to make it. I certainly will not. Ladies and gentlemen, no matter when you discover this principle, I want you to understand there is so much power in believing prayer for the sake of other people in your life. There are miracles in your family waiting for you to trust and believe and start bombarding heaven. You say, well, I've been praying, nothing's happened. Well, that's the second principle I want you to see. You've got to have persistent faith. Not just pray in faith, persistent faith. You say, what do you mean? Well, look again at this interesting, surprising, unsettling passage. Verse 48, so Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And this you is plural. He's really dressing down everybody around. He said, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. That's not what you would have expected from Jesus. You would have expected Jesus to be like a mash unit, to grab immediately his belongings and say, let's rush down to Capernaum and let's put hands on this boy. Let's start. Jesus stiff arms him spiritually. Now, be honest with me. How many of you have ever prayed and you just felt like, I'm tired of praying about this. God just isn't going to answer this prayer. I'm not in sin. I know this prayer is good. I know it ought to be happening, but for whatever reason, come on, you've been praying about something good and it's not happening. How many of you have ever come to the place you say, you know what, I just, I'm tired of praying about this. It's obvious, guys. I'm going to tell you, there's, a, there's a, a, a weapon in the arsenal of the devil that has been so successful against, his, against God's people. It's the poison-tipped arrow of discouragement that God's timing is different than ours. And I'm going to tell you something, it's worked on all of us at one time or another. Some of us, it works on us like this. We, we get all fired up about believing God, and, and we go out and pray, and, and nothing happens. Maybe it gets worse. And here's what happens. We start, we start the enemy starts talking to us, say, well, you didn't deserve, you, you didn't deserve that to be you know, you, look at you. Who, who are you to talk about somebody? You, you're not going to be blessed. God doesn't even love me. I mean, pretty soon we're walking around in our faith like, oh, praise God. You believe in God? Yeah, I'm believing God. I'm going to go to heaven when I die, hopefully. And the devil just sits back and says, got another one. Let me tell you something. I love this man's response when God's, when God's son put that resistance, that headwind from heaven on him. Basically, the man said, sir, we can discuss the theology of this later on, but come quickly, my son is dying. I don't need to talk about whether I deserve it or not. All I know is you're the only one that can help. This is the kind of faith God loves. 
I'm not talking about ugly, you know, difficult, you know, combative type faith, but I'm just telling you that when you feel the resistance from heaven that says, well, it doesn't look like that's going to get answered, rise up in faith like Jacob wrestling with the angel at Peniel and say, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. All I know is that God loves it when his people come to him with the flames of this world all around us, and we come in like firemen with a hose and say, I'm here to do battle in Jesus' name. I believe God has power, and the church has power, and prayer has power, and God's promises are as good as they've ever been. So I'm going to the prayer meeting, and I'm going to— Come on, does anybody believe God today? That's the kind of church I'm talking about. In Jesus' name, not taking no for an answer from the devil. Not going to happen. Persistent faith. Sir, come down quick before my child dies. O. Hallesby was a Norwegian pastor who wrote one of the best books on prayer in the early part of the 20th century. I had to buy it on Amazon. I couldn't find it in print anywhere. And he described the mining techniques in Norway as he was growing up. When they would go to, 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 to do mining, you know, it's not enough if you've got to get down deep. You don't just lay dynamite on the top of the ground, and that doesn't do anything. They've got to drill. They've got to drill a shaft down into that hard rock. And that drilling take, it could take weeks and they drill, and it's back-breaking and agonizing, and, and, they, and, and they, they bust the drill bits, and they, and they dull the bits, and they got to start over. But, but eventually, they drill down, and, and then they're able to put the dynamite charge way down deep, and there's a fuse up here, and they light that fuse. And then, after all that time of agonizing and drilling, then suddenly, boom, everything suddenly changes, and now they can get in and do the mining. But but how many of you know that there's two phases of Norwegian mining? There's the drilling and drilling and drilling and sudden explosion. Hallisby said our prayer life is like that. Man, you go months and years. Come on. How many have been praying for years for something, and you don't see the victory? You don't see any evidence that your prayers are making any difference? Let me tell you, you're in the drilling phase. But one of these days, boom! How many of you know that sudden answers to prayer sometimes take decades? Come on! Sudden answers to prayer sometimes take decades. You've got to just keep praying. you you, you just got to keep believing. You've got to keep uh, drilling. You've got to just keep asking because one of these days, listen, I'm telling you, miracles suddenly occur sometimes after long, long periods of prayer. Faith is never a sprint. It's always a marathon. But then finally, you got to see this. You and I have got to be living a progressing faith. You say, what are you talking about? Look at verse 53. He gets back halfway back to Capernaum. He sees one of his co-workers huffing and puffing up the hill with the good news, your son's going to live. And verse 53 says, the father knew that that was the hour. One o'clock the day before was the hour when Jesus said to him, your son will live. And notice what the Bible says, and he himself believed. You say, wait a minute. This man believed before he ever started. He, it was belief that motivated him to leave Capernaum and go to Canaan in the first place. The Bible says in verse 47, we all quoted together, he believed his word. Now it says he believed. So what's going on here? Can I share with you what's going on? Faith grows over time. If you'll keep believing, you'll grow. You'll believe more tomorrow than you believed yesterday. Listen, where you are today is no indication of where you'll be tomorrow if you'll just keep believing. This man believed, and then he believed some more. He, be he took Jesus at his word, and then he knew the Lord personally. His belief was grounded in revelation. His belief was grounded in miracles. His belief was grounded in answered prayer. His belief 
belief one day was greater than his belief the day before. That's the kind of man I'm going to be. I'm going to be a man that believes more tomorrow than I believe today so I can see God move in my life, my family's life, and my sweet church's life more tomorrow than I've seen today. I will not stop. I will not quit. I'm going to grow in my faith. I've said it before. Let me say it again. Chuck Smith once said, there's only one thing worse than not growing in the Lord, and that's going backwards. We were, listen, you and I were saved not at the point we're going to be. We were saved to continue uh, to grow. If you get saved today, that's the start. That's not the end. That's the front door, not the back door. Listen, you were saved to grow, right? Like that college, we had some students from Europe, and they were walking around the campus one day, and they saw this river running by the campus, and they remember all those races they saw at Cambridge and, and Oxford and the, the, the fantastic rowing teams. And they said, you know, if we had a rowing team here, we got all these guys and, you know, women, they, we could probably get in the Summer Olympics. And so they went to the athletic director and said, let's have a rowing team. And the athletic director said, we're not going to have any sport at this school where the goal is to sit down and go backwards. It's just not going to happen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in the kingdom of God, you were not saved to sit down and go backwards. You were saved for forward motion so that you can be a blessing to the people around you. Everybody jump up on your feet.